Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you here in Doha. Uh, I've been traveling across several continents in recent years, not just to the countries that people are fleeing from around the world, but also to the places they're fleeing to, to the refugee camps, migrant camps that people end up in. And I've been struck by so many thoughts during this time, but one of them is that there are so many utopian dreams that occur. People dream that you could live in a borderless world on one hand. Other people pretend you could just stop anyone coming. These are impossible dreams, but somewhere in the middle of them is something we need to aim for. And one of the ways I've started to realize that we need to think about this is in the following terms, not about right or wrong or you know, good and bad, uh, I'm a good person, you're a Nazi, it's too easy. What we need to think about with this is that we're in a situation with migration talking about competing virtues. There are two virtues in this whole debate that are in serious competition, not just between people, but within all of us. The first virtue, I would say, is the virtue of mercy, the desire to be merciful to our fellow human beings who are suffering. And we all feel that. Everybody should feel that. But there is also another virtue here, the virtue of justice. And that's not just justice for people fleeing countries, but justice for people in the countries that they are fleeing to. And we can't ignore those two parts. We need to recognize that's what's going on here. This is why it's so difficult, and the debate goes down the middle of all of us. So look, there are so many questions we need to think about if we're going to address this. And I'm so glad, by the way, this isn't a debate, because this is a very not debatable issue but why we need to think about this. Let me give you just six examples of things we need to think about much more deeply than we have. The first is this. I would suggest it is very obvious that the developing world cannot move to the developed world. So what do we do? Who can come? That's one quest part of that question. And the second part, which is much harder, who can't? We are very, very bad at having even a bit of that debate, but we need to. Secondly, what are the differences between people fleeing for their lives from a war zone and people fleeing serious, severe economic deprivation in, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa? Now, there are differences, but if you recognize that, then you've got to work out where along the way you would put your line for legitimate asylum claims. A third of people in sub-Saharan Africa polled last year by Gallup said they wanted to move and leave sub-Saharan Africa. So you've got to work out along this way if you're going to have a sustainable asylum policy, who qualifies for it? And I would suggest we're not very good at having that discussion either. A third point. We know that some cultures find it easier to mix into other cultures than others, but we don't know exactly how. And we don't know what the proportions of people are in another culture that work well, integrate well, adapt well, and what the proportions are that start to make that integration, that adaptation far harder. We have thought very little about this, and what thinking there has been has been pretty bad. Let me give you another example of something we need to think about. How do we deal with a question this serious in the age of social media? An age when a single photograph of a single person can go all around the world, and everybody sees it, and everybody says something must be done. And their politicians think, I've got to do something. And then they do something, and the public say, no, that wasn't the something we were thinking of. We've thought of something else, but we don't know what. How do we live in that world? How do politicians act in that world? How do we have any form of political leadership in that world? How do we work out what the right thing to do is in that world? Not just in the short term, but in the long term too. If you give you a fifth question. How do we ensure that we're able to have a serious and deep debate about these issues and that we're able to allow people to express legitimate concerns and have that debate without those legitimate concerns being dismissed as xenophobic, nativist, and so on. How do we work out where that might be the case? And how do we work out where it's not, where there are legitimate fears? Sixth question, how do we overcome fatalism? The fatalism you hear everywhere these days, sometimes in the spirit of optimism. This is the world as it is now. People move. This is globalization. Get used to it. Suck it up. Don't complain. How do we get used to that? How do we deal with that? Now, I've got, rather unsurprisingly, fewer answers than I've got questions. But let me give you just three answers I would suggest that we could hold on to as the beginning of a set of answers to this. The first is, hold a very clear line between people fleeing for their lives from war zones and people fleeing economic deprivation. Find and hold to a very clear line on it. If you do not, I predict with absolute certainty that you will continue to erode public sympathy with people who need the sympathy the most, because these things will be rubbed together and elided. 
So, how, so I would suggest, first of all, find that and hold on to it pretty close. Second thing I would suggest, find a broad level of agreement, and there is a lot of this internationally now, that the best way to cope with the most serious situations is to keep people roughly in the area of the country for which they fled. It's much easier to look after them there. It's much easier to get international aid there. My own country, Great Britain, is, I think, the second largest donor of international aid within the regions of Syria. That should, I think, be one of the models for this, that we, we make sure that people... We don't have this idea that some people have that you disperse X percentage there and X percentage there and put these people there. Thirdly, I would say, make sure you increase economic productivity in refugee camps. Make sure people have a hope and a purpose and a work life when they're outside of their country. Look, I'm concluding with this because otherwise the music will get so loud you won't hear me. There are no simple answers to this because there are no simple questions in this. This whole business does not give itself to sound bites, but it does need a much deeper debate than most of us have been willing to have so far. Thank you. All right.